Hello, everybody. It's Dave Neal, stand-up comic and host of Bachelor Nation News. We have a little bit of an update, a very, very free-flowing conversation with regards to what's going on in the Clayton Eckerd v. Jane Doe paternity scandal. Uh, it's getting complicated if it wasn't already so and so this is like a graduate level conversation happening i'm not here to uh break down the you know uh how this all began type of thing at this point i just assume you guys are in the thick of it with me well there's information that has come out and trust me when i say it's come out from all angles and i don't know where this um hcg test came from it might be in the discovery i'm really not too sure it might be in one of the motions but legal vices our good friend uh, uh residing in south korea has been doing the some say lord's work here in discussing the hcg levels that were obtained i guess in mid-october now because we've had people wonder how could jane doe test positive for pregnancy if they believe she wasn't and then people have sent me things like this which is kind of like a you know a um uh, you know, HCG water drops positive test. You know, you can get this, uh, you can buy this stuff online to test positive for pregnancy, which people in the comment section say does work. You know, they show their videos of them testing positive based on using this. But again, if there's a blood test taken that shows HCG levels, this doesn't, you know, apply. This could apply for initial testing, but I think we can all assume and operate under the understanding that HCG is in the blood of one Jane Doe. Uh, and how it got there, I guess, is the sort of um, center question within this case. Now, as teased here, I received an email from Jane Doe's lawyer. Uh, in the email, he asked me, you know, for now, not to read the sort of contents of his email, I guess because he says it'll feed the trolls. Um, I'm all about being open and honest and transparent, but for now, I don't see a benefit for me to share his email, namely because it appears like he wants to play nice and I want to play nice. And so why piss that off? Now, if there's any other reason why I need to share the email or, you know, I, I you know, have and sent it to journalist friends just to say, is this normal to get an email of this nature from uh, a lawyer who's representing a client in the case that I'm covering? Uh, and again, uh, my, my goal throughout this whole entire case has been to provide all the evidence and transparency to everybody. Uh, I believe he believes through the email I received, that I'm not giving Jane Doe that fair uh, sort of coverage. I know Jane Doe has felt as if I haven't given her fair coverage. The one thing I'm still confused about is what the motive is of her lawyer to help her because, or, or, or to email me. And I will summarize some parts of the email I received. I actually initially made four screen grabs and shared them with you. Uh, or I at least posted them to share them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stay on my home screen and not share any of it right now um, because uh, I think it's fine if I just summarize it for you, uh, how that all went down. So I'm going to get to that. If you could stick around for that, I want to lead up to that moment where I get an email from him. I think the email came maybe Friday. I don't really remember. And he was just like, why haven't you, why haven't you gotten on the phone with me? Why don't we just talk on the phone? And of course, I made the joke saying it's going to cost you $800 an hour. Of course, I was kidding, by the way. I, I hope that uh, that that passed through. It's not about the money. I, I just, he's new to the party. We already know all the information from Jane Doe. At this point, she's no longer pregnant, according to her. I, through my own opinion, of course, which I'm entitled to, don't believe she ever was pregnant. I do believe that she lied. What I guess, um, what I guess her lawyer doesn't want me to do is say she lied uh, because I cannot, I guess, definitively prove that she lied and that would be considered defamation. Again, that's according to them. I'm operating under the uh, falsus in uno, falseness, uh, falsus in omnibus. Did I pronounce that right? I'm not a lawyer, but I'm operating under the, the pretense that she has admitted through her own deposition to have fabricated um some evidence. She claims she did it because she didn't want Clayton to find her, this and that. Uh, but we have this whole paper trail of evidence that kind of came out of thin air and then doesn't really exist. My cross-examining of his motion revealed that he said she never actually received medical treatment. She only said she sought it. And my response to that was, well, here she is in the deposition. If anything, I feel like I've at least helped um, her lawyer, not through my own sort of intention, but I think we've helped her lawyer um, iron iron out his case because we've poked holes in it, saying, no, you can't make that claim because she already said this. No, you can't make that claim because she already did this. And, and for that, 
you know, he says that he wants, you know, truth and he's willing to drop her as a client if he finds out she's lying. I think we're just looking at it from different aspects where we're seeing a preponderance of evidence that shows Clayton never actually had sex through, you know, early emails where he says, hey, Jane, we only had oral like this and that. I'm looking at all that, you know, where he had no real reason to lie. And then I'm also looking at all of the times where she claimed she was pregnant in the past now at least four times. And some of those ended in coercing her to take plan B and some ended in miscarriage and this and that. It's just, it all doesn't line up. I think we can all agree. I think her lawyer would agree with that if this was just like two guys at a pub talking about it, but he's being paid by her. So what he's going to try to do, and I don't even, I'm not upset about this. He's being paid, I'm assuming, to or make sure the check cashes, to, um, to work for her. So if he can find any fault, any cracks in any of the motions, if he can find any case law that says, well, since she no longer is pregnant, that she can dismiss this. If, she, if he can find anything he can to help her, that's what he's going to do. But also, he says he wants her well-being and Clayton's. I think. I think if if he truly, if we find out that he le that he, uh, you know, uh, you know, dismisses himself from this case, we'll then understand he realizes he doesn't have a good case and that she's lying and that he doesn't want to be a part of it. He sounds like a winner. He sounds like the type of guy who ha who's like he wins. You know, he wins for his clients. That's what he said to me in the email. Um, <clears throat> I, a lot of people will wonder, Dave, do you take this email as a threatening email? This email that says he has a cease and desist drafted up uh, that will be that could be sent to me, but he decided not to. I don't know. I'm not going to say I don't feel threatened because even if you say this isn't a threatening email, when someone says they are ready to send you a legal or, or you know a letter t telling you to stop of reporting, I guess um, it's interesting. I don't know what his cease and desist would say um, because he didn't send it to me, but he did say that he has an eight-page cease and desist with my name on it, which would be, I believe, the second or third uh, that would be sent to me from her or her counsel. Uh, her other one, she hired someone on up counsel to, you know, whatever. But it seems as though she's not, she's done playing ball as far as um, she's done, you know, at first it was like, you know, she had she she paid some guy probably fifty bucks to send me the cease and desist. And now, obviously, she's got a lawyer who's got way more notoriety. You know, and um, I think in the email that was sent to me, the lawyer presented, "Hey, I've represented these celebrity clients. I've done this. I've won for my clients. I've had people that I fought against lose their bar license. I think we saw on Reddit that he already filed some sort of bar complaint against Woodnick Law. I don't even know how that works. Um, I don't know if that's public information that you can find or if that was just rumors through the chat boards. I'm really not sure. Uh, but he said he's got a goal and he says, um, you and I may not agree on many things, but I'm sure you would agree that Jane Doe needs help. And the same can be said about Clayton. Now, of course they need help. They both need uh, representation here. I would argue my opinion, and this is, I guess, where it gets kind of lost, where he, as a lawyer, argues for people's right to say things. Um, that's kind of like his big thing is like, uh, he's a First Amendment rights lawyer. And I guess he would argue that my, that everything I'm saying doesn't protect me in the First Amendment. I don't know. Uh, that would that would be for the court system to to deal with. But I believe I've spoken nothing but the truth. And my opinion doesn't come out of thin air, right? He's new to this case. My opinion comes from following this case since I don't know August or whenever September, whenever the hell September, whenever it broke, right? So my opinion is based on information I've seen, and that's kind of where I live. Um, he says his goal is basic. He, um, Jane Doe wants me to leave her alone. Uh, he says, if I were in her shoes, I'd feel the same way. Um, most people would. I understand that. I understand that Jane Doe wants me to leave her alone. I would argue I've given her the most amount of grace I could in a process where I'm trying to seek uh, and expose justice for Clayton Eckerd, right? In exposing justice for him, I've given her the benefit of not saying her name. And he says, well, you're allowed to say her name. I don't care about the legal aspect of that. I've wanted to keep my hands clean of her feeling any collateral damage of the internet coming after her. I think because her lawyer's new to this case, 
he and and by the way, none of which anything I'm saying right now is me uh, trying to treat him like an idiot, right? I just think he's new to the case, and there's a lot going on here. So he might think that the justice for Clayton Twitter, the justice for Clayton Reddit, me, Megan Fox, he might think we're all in on this thing where we're all working together, and that's kind of true, but kind of not. We all come from different aspects of life and have found this case, and some people call it the Roman Empire. They are, some people are really justice-oriented, right? Uh, but as he says, he says, having spent 10 business days on this case, which is nothing, um, uh, 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 he, well, anyway, I don't, I don't want to read what he said just yet or, 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 or at all. I don't know if it helps the case, and I'd rather not, um, I'd rather not piss him off because even if I feel I am in the right to say what I've been saying, you still don't want to piss someone off who can do and pull a lot of moves that could just make things sort of murky for you. I think what he has learned is that I won't be smeared and that the audience fully has like empathized with me in this situation. I think he understands that. Um, the world's in a weird place right now where I'm not the one who had, who, who uh, hooked up with Jane Doe, right? I'm not, I'm just the one who's covered this and I've tried to do it fairly and you, and you could argue what, but you're not and this and that. Well, I, I think I think I've done a really good job in the coverage and as the kind of first person to really cover this, I think I'm getting the absolute brunt of the arrows kind of shot at anyone trying to seek truth. I don't think a judge or anyone in media would think it a good thing for a lawyer trying to silence a journalist who's trying to seek the truth. I'm not claiming that her lawyer's trying to silence me. He says here in this email, Keep talking about it. Just be careful. He wants me to cover it fairly. I don't necessarily know what that means, in part because I'm under the belief that these blood samples that show little to no fetal DNA are the definitive proof that she isn't nor ever was pregnant. That's my belief. That's my interpretation of science, right? Of medical science. That's my interpretation of it. So I'm sharing that from that belief. I, I haven't seen him yet address the little to no fetal DNA from the first, the second, the third, the fourth. One of them got lost in the mail. Three out of four tests. Three out of three that were received and analyzed by a professional company have showed that they could not find the DNA. So what we have here, which I'm going to share with you guys, is uh, some results from the HCG test. Um, I want to share this with you just real quickly. Uh, Law of Vices covered this. Uh, the results of the test were from October 16th. She had a 102 level, which you might say, what the hell does that mean? All right. It's a falsified report. See the handwritten letters. I didn't. I don't see any handwritten letters so, on the paper. So I'm just going to talk my way through this because this is a six and a half hour live stream by Legal Vices. His channel is blown up not just for covering this case but covering others. And these papers that show 102. Um, I guess anything over a four um, uh, MIU per milliliters would be considered above the standard. Again. I am not a doctor, so what I'm telling you is my interpretation of these results. So she received a 102, which you go, oh my gosh, that's so much higher than a normal HCG level. Well, here what we find out is that the placenta starts releasing HCG 6 to 12 days after ovulation. The levels usually double every 29 to 53 hours, says an OBGYN at Texas Children's Pavilion for Women. So we would need an expert to analyze all of this, but the the trend of HCG at eight to 10 weeks peaks at around the, this doubling trend continues until eight to 10 weeks after implantation when HCG levels peak at around 90,000 to 100,000 MIU. Then HCG starts plateauing because the placenta takes over estrogen and progesterone production. A healthy HCG levels don't always double every two days. The level, so the levels could be all over the place. But a 104 level would be enough to trip a pregnancy test. It seems to me as though pregnancy tests are mainly very polar. Either you're pregnant or you're not. Either you have HCG above the normal level or you don't. And those pregnancy tests that test with HCG are just an initial indicator. We would have to see, and this is where an argument, argument might come up, we would have to see whether or not she ever tested positive for pregnancy through the actual means of a test, which would be uh, an ultrasound, seeing the baby. That's like literally the only way to fully know if you're pregnant because all these other tests are just indicators of a pregnancy. So it seems as though he's going to argue that because she believed she was pregnant, that she can say she was pregnant. 
I'm arguing right now that I believe she wasn't pregnant, my opinion, because of the little to no fetal DNA of the what I believe to be her lying in the deposition. And I say her lying because she admitted to that. So I don't think that's a question. She admitted to, 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 to you know, fabricating information within, uh, within these ultrasounds, right? And then also I look at this and go, HCG levels should be at 90,000 or 100,000. We're not even close. We're not even playing ball when we're talking 102. We're not even in the same ballpark. So again, uh, any, any sort of medical profession, professional who looks at this, they'll, they'll have more to say about it, but they might see that she tested this way when in October, uh, June, July, so four months pregnant, she shouldn't have been there at all. And her argument might be, well, at that point I had already miscarried. I don't know what the argument would be. There's always an argument. There's always this out because she she's kind of like rewriting the story. So that's what's important to know is that uh, what she said happened in January is different from what she said happened in November, from different from September. And it's hard to pin her down in a way because she keeps on rewriting the story. It's my belief that by rewriting the story, by sharing new information that doesn't necessarily, you know, that, that doesn't catch her in a trap or whatever, as, as she kind of sort of dodges this thing, that it's, it's a way of... Um, it's a way of like trying to get out of it. That's that's my opinion and my belief. And as a journalist and as a commentator, I'm allowed to have those opinions. Imagine being sued because I don't believe her. I guess their argument would be that me saying she lied as a statement of fact would be defamation. I think it would be very hard, and I know him and I might disagree with this, but I think it would be very hard for a jury or even a judge to look at all of this information and side against a journalist who's seeking the truth. I think that would be very hard. That's my opinion. But again, even if his email says, Dave, I'm not threatening you, you'll know when I'm threatening you. Even with all that said, it 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 reads as threatening because I'm just trying to do my best. I'm just trying to cover this case. I'm not slandering her. I'm not um, I'm not knocking her. I'm not even sharing any information about this attorney or his past or any of these other things. Um, I do appreciate that this attorney of hers, um, uh, it, I do appreciate that it looks like his attempt was to play nice with me. You know, he called, I guess, me and um, me and Megan Fox pawn scum. Maybe he was talking specifically about Megan. I think Megan's been great in this case. I think she's done a really great job of exposing the truth, and it's so it's so refreshing to have people get my back here um, in the world of YouTube and law and journalism because you got to stick together because if someone can just threaten a journalist. And I'm not saying he's doing that. But, you know, by sending an email to somebody saying, hey, I've sued these people. I've beat these people. I'm not the one, I'm not the type who loses. He says that. And then he says, I've got a cease and desist I can send to you. Uh, Jane Doe can decide after she wins this case who she's going to sue next. That's essentially what he said is after this case is over, after, after I take a vacation, we can come back and Jane Doe can say, all right, who do we need to sue next to, to, um, to, you know, to, you know, that has wronged us or that has defamed us or this or that. Well, whether it's a threat email or not, I mean, the, the message, the message is received and it doesn't mean I'm not going to continue talking about the case. In fact, he says, continue to talk about the case. Just be careful and don't say she lied. So, um, I always think it's good to listen to advice, even if it's coming from someone that would be considered uh, an ad ad adversary. And I appreciate the advice, although I wonder what the intention and motive is. I don't think he cares about my best interest. Of course he's not. We're all out for ourselves, right? So his best interest is winning the case and or, you know, having his next project be whatever it's going to be. Um, but this isn't my... This isn't my uh, hill to die on as far as what I do with my life. Uh, but if I just, like I've said in the past, and again, apologies if this does come off as rambling, but if I did just cower, stop talking about this, um, decide not to cover this case from the first time she sent me a cease and desist months ago, then look what might have happened to Clayton Eckert. I don't think I would have slept well at night. I sleep better knowing she might want to or sue me for defamation I sleep better knowing that than if I didn't do the right thing. 
I still live in a world where I believe doing the right thing will play will will uh, will play in my favor. So the HCG test for, was 102 on October 16th, a lab value you'd expect to be much higher if you were in your second trimester. At the same time, an alarming value that I wouldn't wait until mid-November to see the doctor and get checked out. That's right. She saw Dr. Higley the Friday before her November 2nd court date. Again, he he probably didn't know this. He probably didn't see this. I'm assuming he was catching up on all of this, but he said she sought medical treatment. She didn't receive it. But here she admits on November 2nd, she received medical treatment from Dr. Higley the Friday before, a perinatologist, uh, whatever, uh, neo, whatever the hell this term is for what he does. Uh, why didn't she mention such a low HCG level to him at that visit? So yes, 102 is low if you're in your second trimester, but extremely high if you're not pregnant or at least high if you're not pregnant. That test that she had is specifically used for detection of early pregnancy. Intended use immunoassay for the in vitro quantitative determination of the sum of human chorionic, oh my gosh, so many words, um, is intended for use for early pregnancy test. So again, it, it's these pregnancy tests aren't meant to catch people. They're meant to say, oh yeah, you're probably pregnant. You have this hormone you don't normally have. In most cases, you don't have this hormone. You've got it. You might be pregnant. Go see the doctors. That's that's what the pregnancy test, of course, is made for. In her case, if she knew she would test positive for HCG before even hooking up with Clayton, then she can make these arguments. Now, her argument has changed. She's now accused him of SA. She's accused him of the R word, right? Uh, but... Before that, she said her her excuse of getting knocked up was, well, we kind of hooked up and then we grinded and there might have been something that uh, you know I felt something wet, you know this and that. So it's like you got to figure out your story, you know, because it's hard to defend against your story if you don't even know which story you're going with. Um, I'm very confident in having this conversation as I'm having it. I don't want these types of videos to be a back and forth with Jane's attorney. And me, so I just would politely say at this point, I don't think there's anything Jane's attorney needs to send me. Um, if there's any evidence that proves her case, I think that needs to go through the court system. I'm happy to report on it as it's gone through the court system. But the problem we've had with Jane so far, and that's why the trust is completely obliterated between covering Jane's side, is that she's been called out for manipulating evidence in multiple cases with multiple different circumstances. So why should we believe what information she has? I'm not going to hold up on the HCG test. I'm going to hold up on the little to no fetal DNA. So let the fresh air in, great YouTube title, by the way, let the fresh air in uh, posted her update on Clayton's case, uh, I guess, just this morning. So everyone go support that. Have a listen. Always believe when a woman says something happened to her or makes a claim like this because I'm like, well, what does she have to gain by making all of this up? It's not going to be a positive experience for her. I mean, there's really no way to go around it. It is not going to be good. So at the beginning, a lot of people believed her and she's the one that went public with all of this information. But then later when- I'd say more than a lot of people, just about everyone believed her. Uh, trust then verify. Of course, that's the famous saying, right? Trust then verify. The verification didn't didn't pan up. A test showed that there was no fetal DNA. Three tests. It was like, okay, so is she lying? Now, to be fair, the test showed little to no fetal DNA. And I guess that's also the place where we have an issue because the test can't, it says little to no. It says there's none or very little. And what does that very little mean? And I guess we might need Ravgen to further explain what little to no means. Um, would three tests that say little to no, like 0.001% chance times 0.001% chance equals 0.00000001% chance, right? We understand how that all works. My math might not line up, but the idea being the how rare it would be to receive a little to no fetal DNA three times is exponentially rarer. So it's not little to no fetal DNA. It is extremely extremely little to no fetal DNA, of course, that being lined up with no actual uh, medical records of an actual ultrasound, you know, that all lines up and you go, come on, folks, aren't we allowed the opinion that she lied about being pregnant? That's the opinion that many are coming to. And by many, I mean, it's essentially 100% people don't believe her, except her mom and possibly her lawyer who might still be on the fence of this information. But then later, when a test showed that there was no fetal DNA, it was like, okay, so is she lying? And then later we come to find out that 
they didn't even have intercourse. They only did oral. So it's just the mental gymnastics you have to do to like figure out what's going on in this case. And I So she never said, and again, I think this is fair reporting. She never said they didn't have sex. She just said they were sexually intimate. So initially she danced around the words that, words that they didn't have sex. He was the one who privately said, hey Jane, we only had oral sex. What's interesting is in sharing everything publicly, she very oddly redacted that line. I think that's very interesting to her motivation is that she didn't want the public to know they, that he claims they only had oral sex. So this case would be extremely different if they both admitted to having, having had sex. It would be extremely different. I feel like every time she hires a new attorney, they have to go through this mental gymnastics. So on February 2nd, Clayton has a deposition and Jane Doe is actually there. On February 6th, Clayton's lawyer files a motion to get additional time in the trial. Because right, so, there's it, so, so, so she goes through a lot of the information we've covered here, but I think that's great that she's covering it and Megan Fox and the umbrella guy on YouTube and all these, and of course, legal vices. This is really big for journalism, for YouTubers. And I see a lot of journalists and YouTubers coming together here. And then when you factor in the fact that I'm a comedian, you see a lot of comedians that aren't going to stand for this being namely Joe Rogan and Theo Vaughn and all of these comedians with some of the biggest platforms in the world will not stand by if a journalist and stand-up comedian is sued for defamation. They won't do it. There will be a war chest of legal funds raised into the um, eight or nine figure level. And I, and I don't say that lightly, this, this um, sort of, um, you know, uh, I'll be honest, comedians are pond scum to the extent that, you know, they spend the majority of their career living out of their cars and in the couches and they don't really get intimidated well by like losing their fortune. Um, in the arguments in emails sent to me, there was, you know, saying, hey, would you really want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing here and I, I prefer not to, I prefer to you to hear exactly what he said, but he said, justice for Clayton, bro, I want justice for Clayton as much as you do. I want justice for Clayton or Jane Doe, whoever deserves it. We just don't know who that is yet, but we will. And I guess we will. We will find out who's going to be getting the justice. Um, he says, there's one thing you should know. I'm on, I'm, I am only here to help. Uh, if you think I'm only here to help Jane, you're wrong. I have told her and I've told Greg, the lawyer, and the same thing. If Jane is lying, I will withdraw from this case in a heartbeat. And if Jane is lying, she will lose this case. And I won't lose a wink of sleep over that. If Jane is lying, she should lose this case. I guess the argument that will be made as to whether he believes she's lying is whether he believes that she believes she was pregnant. In which case, we won't even have to rely on medical evidence because maybe there's some sort of, I don't know, medical condition where she actually believes she is pregnant. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes into this case at all. So... This lawyer has asked me to not be the guy who goes down with a sinking ship. He asked me, he basically sort of, you know, um, explained how uh, some of the lies that he thinks I have said are akin to how Trump lied. And, you know, Trump was sued for 83 million and plus more than that, actually. Um, but his case, of course, was against um, a lady who accused him of rape. And then that case was, of course, I believe... Um, I believe, uh, adjudicated with a jury, all right? Um, but he does say this, and I want to give him credit. He says, that doesn't mean you can't talk about the case. I'm not trying to censor you. Talk all you want, please. Just be more careful, like a lot more careful. If you don't want to get sued into bankruptcy, you need to stop acting like those before you who ended up in that position. They were arrogant. They thought they were right. They believed the First Amendment would save them. They were all wrong in every way. Um, I guess believing you're right in the, is different. Well, I'd argue this. I don't necessarily believe, I don't believe in many things, but I believe I'm pursuing the truth. And, um, I believe as a journalist, um, I am following the evidence and the facts, and I'm doing two things. I'm letting the audience come to their conclusion. And I'm also coming to my own conclusion. And where I stand right now is I believe that Clayton Eckerd is the victim of a kind of a, like a scam. That's what I believe. Um, would I look at evidence that she, that maybe a medical provider would provide that she's believed she was pregnant and she munch, munchausen 
uh, you know, syndrome by proxy or whatever the hell, whatever the hell these different disorders are. Well, that's a whole different conversation that nobody's making online. Um, but I did receive an interesting comment from, uh, or I did see an, an interesting comment uh, that said this. I think it's clear today that interacting with Jane's lawyer is only helping her. He's using the information sent to him to form a better defense. It's best to let him figure it out on his own limited timeline instead of pointing out where his logic has holes. Imagine if he had presented the 102 HCG level in court as proof of a 20-week pregnancy of twins. As much as it pains me to say, that begs the question of having that type of discussion here as well. Um, so I think the deal is this. Uh, I'm going to try to cover this case more so based on what goes through the court system. And if, you know, I stumble upon new evidence I need to share, that's a different story, right? But, you know, I think most of the evidence has already gone through the court system. Now, there will be experts that will weigh in on that evidence, and then the judge will make a decision. If she wins because she hasn't lied, well, that evidence will be be there. And I, I just, you know, we have, I don't know, there's hundreds of lawyers that, have, that are looking into this, you know, both on the internet and and, and lawyers in real life and my lawyer, I've, you know, obviously sent my, this email that I was received. The first thing I did was send it to my personal lawyer. Um, and I've sent it to journalists to, to get advice and say, what does this mean? Am I, what's going on here? And I think that's fair. I think the worst thing that can happen is things happen privately behind closed doors and we don't air that out. That's the most dangerous thing that can happen. That's how Clayton got in this position. And I don't want to follow that same path where my mental health is destroyed because I'm getting private emails and I'm not sharing them with people. Um, so that's where I stand right now. I don't see a need for the public to see that email yet. But like I said, I've shared it with journalists. I've shared it um, with my lawyer. And I'll continue to do that because I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm covered, I'm protected. And then I continue to cover this case in the sort of um, uh, most, what I believe to be ethical way possible. That's where I stand, folks. And again, <laughs> I say this again. I'm not seeking a war with Jane Doe's lawyer, not uh, by a long shot. I'm, I'm, I would be in, um, uh, I would not have home field advantage with regards to that. That is not what I like to do. I go on stage, I tell jokes. I got a show tonight in Murfreesboro. Sunday night, I have a show in Nashville at the Nashville Comedy Festival. I'm producing a show called Love Bombing. It's gonna be so much fun. We have Bachelor alumni coming. There's gonna be some really funny stand-up comedians. That's what I like to do. I like to bring joy and laughter to the world, really. But in this specific instance, we've kind of got stuck with the tab here to defend Clayton because I didn't see any, uh, m many bigger uh, commentary, comment commentarians in the bachelor world, uh, picking up that bill. So this is, I guess the, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, thanks we get for that. Um, it's very fascinating. Uh, and I appreciate all your support. I'll be live on Patreon to continue to discuss this patreon.com slash Dave Neal. Thanks guys.